let's talk about specifically a coil of wire that we are spinning in a magnetic field to induce an EMF. Now we're talking about AC generation. So I'm going to try and draw a coil 3D for starters. And it's spinning around that axis there. What we're going to do is move this side up and this side down. So it's cutting the field lines there. But it gets a little bit confusing if I draw it like that, so I'm going to draw it in 2D instead. There's my field lines, and here is my coil of wire there. We're looking end on. I'm moving this side up and this side down. As we're turning it, at some point it's also going to be perpendicular to the field lines. So we're going to forget about that for now. Here the coil is parallel to the field, and here the coil is perpendicular to the field. Now, how much flux is filling up the coil when it's parallel to the field? We can see that the field lines just go along the coil there, so actually the flux is zero. What about here? Well, the field lines are cutting perfectly perpendicularly to the coil, so we say that flux at that point is at a max. Now I know I'm saying flux here, same thing goes for flux linkage, because this coil is going to have n turns. The really important question is, what is the EMF at each of these points? When is the EMF changing the fastest? Is it changing here the fastest, or is it changing here the fastest? What's weird is that at this point here, even though we have no flux, the flux is changing the fastest at this point. So that means that we have max EMF. That seems a little bit counterintuitive, doesn't it? We actually have the greatest EMF when we have zero flux, but that is the case. What's even more weird is that when we have this coil that's got the maximum amount of flux crossing it, we actually have no EMF induced at all at that point. So with a spinning coil, flux and EMF do the opposite to each other. So let's draw a graph of this. So I'm going to draw the flux first. And I'm going to say it's starting at this point here. What do we have? Zero flux. But as it starts turning, that flux increases. And then it ends up here at 90 degrees when it has the maximum amount of flux. But then it's going to come back down in the opposite direction. We have a sine wave. And we have a maximum flux there and there. What is that equals to? That's equals to B A N. Well, this is going to be minus B A N down here. So the flux is changing sinusoidally. What about our EMF then? Now, we said that the coil at the beginning is parallel. Even though we have no flux, we have a max EMF. So actually, we're going to end up with an EMF that starts there. Now, OK, technically, I probably should start that at the bottom because it should be minus but we're only concerned with the magnitude for now. As we come down to here, when we have maximum flux, we actually have zero EMF. So what we're going to get is this here. So that means that flux, I'm going to put flux linkage, and EMF, they're 90 degrees out of phase pi over two radians out of phase. So we're going to call this maximum EMF E0. So our max EMF is given by ban, which is our flux linkage, times omega, which is just 2 pi f. So if you know the flux density, the area, number of turns, and how fast it's spinning, then you can find out the max EMF. That shows that if you spin the coil faster, that's not only going to make the peaks closer together, but it's also going to make the peaks higher, giving a higher peak EMF. But we know that if we're going to find out the EMF at any time during its spinning, then we know it's going to be a fraction of that max EMF. Now, the EMF started at a maximum here, so we're going to use cos instead of sine. If it started at zero, we'd use sine instead. And that's given by cos omega t. Cos omega t is just the fraction of the max EMF that we started with. Putting those two things together, we end up with an EMF at any time of ban omega cos omega t or sine omega t depending on where the emf started 
Now in power stations, they actually do things the opposite way around. They don't actually have the coil of wire spinning. What they have instead are three sets of stators. Then what they have is the magnet spinning inside. This is actually an electromagnet where they can change the flux density produced by it so it's just right so they get just the speed that they want. This magnet, this electromagnet, spins at 50 hertz in the middle of all of these stators. These are the coils here, so one coil, this is one circuit, this is one circuit, this is one circuit here, and then they go off to the national grid. So that does mean that each power station actually produces three separate EMFs. That's why with power cables you have more than just two wires, because you have all three of these phases, as they're called, being sent out to the national grid. I know for a fact on my street, all three phases come into the substation. One phase goes to house number one. It also goes to house number four, number seven. This phase goes to house number two, five. So these phases go to every third house. That's not always the case, but that's what the case is on my street. Heavy industries, factories, that kind of thing can actually combine all three phases to get the power that they need to operate their big machinery. One last thing we need to think about is back EMF, and that's in a motor. So why are we talking about motors? Well, we said that when it comes to the motor effect and the dynamo effect, we can't have one without causing the other as well. That means that when motor spins, when a motor turns, also produces the dynamo effect. So we have an EMF supplied to a coil of wire in a magnetic field that causes it to turn, but as it starts to turn, it's also cutting field lines, so that means that it's going to try and oppose the change that caused it to begin with. So this is due to Lenz's law. So is there a way to mitigate this? Yes, there is. If we supply same voltage to motor, at what point do we have a small dynamo effect? At what point do we have a big dynamo effect? The opposing EMF, that is the EMF trying to push back in the other direction to the voltage supplied to the motor, is going to be high when the motor is spinning fast, but it's going to be small when it's spinning slow. When do we get a motor spinning fast? When it's unloaded. No load. In other words, when you have a motor that's not connected to anything, it's just spinning by itself. The opposing EMF or the back EMF is small when spinning slow, when it's under heavy load. So the motor is connected to something, so it's lifting something. We're still supplying the same voltage to the motor, but because it's under load, that means that it's not spinning that fast. So the back EMF is small. So we have our power supply here. We have our motor there, and we have a voltmeter across our motor. So let's say that in this case, the voltage supplied by the battery, the power supply is V, and that's pushing in this direction. But then we have our motor producing a back EMF, which opposes it and pushes back in this direction here. We give that the symbol epsilon. So we say that the voltage supplied by the battery minus the back EMF equals the voltage across the motor, and that's what we're gonna measure there. In symbols, that's V minus epsilon, that's a back EMF, equals IR, this being resistance of the motor times the current. So that means that this current is going to be high if the back EMF is small. If you think I've missed anything or if you have any questions, please put a comment down below and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Bye for now.